Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to continue our service today in our message series on money. That's about how, how much response you usually get when you talk about money. I don't know why. Uh, I think it's because people are a little afraid that God might ask them for some. And so some people just stay away from the church because they don't want no, nobody touching their pockets. And so they're a little concerned about that. But what we've done for the number of weeks is explain all the details of a a real, holy, strategic life concerning your finances. Uh, money is such a powerful force in the world, and it's a powerful force in your life, and it can do some damage to us if we don't know the truth about money. Uh, money, I saw this, that money is like an, a wild animal that must be tamed. It can cause dumb decisions to be made. It can cause undue stress and worry and anxiety. It can cause all sorts of sin in your life. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Amen? Amen. And so we've, we've mentioned quite extensively about the attitude that we need to have about money. And so a lot of things we learn, it's designed to flush us out to renew our mind to like a, a river needs to run through our brains concerning this new life in Christ. And part of that new life includes how we feel about unrighteous mammon or money. Maybe a little hoot and a holler would be good about right now. I'll tell you, if you'll follow these principles, we've already covered six. Today we'll cover the seventh principle. If you'll follow the principles, it will be like plugging the holes in your bucket, and then God will be able to pour more into your financial bucket. I assure you it'll work. I promise you the Word of God will work when you follow the principles. Absolutely. Now, we are uh, trying to erase out of every one of us and beat that thing out of us that tries to get rich quick. A little hoop and a holler would be helpful right about now. Because get rich quick is not God's plan for us. It's not a biblical way to get wealthy. And so lottery ticket buying needs to end. And I'm going to keep saying that until you all quit buying lottery tickets. That's a false hope. It's a tax on the poor. It's unrighteous. It's not going to lead to anything. Not one of you is ever going to win the lottery. The Bible says, He that gathers little by little shall increase. Wealth gotten hastily shall be diminished. So it's no mystery that most lottery winners lose all their money quickly. Okay, so God's system is, is something totally different. So here's the principles we've already covered. Let me run through them real fast one last time. Number one, if you're going to be prosperous with God, you're going to have to work. There's no sitting on the couch quoting prosperity scriptures trying to get rich. Okay, number one, you've got to work. It's a scary word for some people, uh, but it's a habit that every wealthy person has developed and kept. Number two, you're going to have to develop a prosperous soul. Uh, that means inside you is going to have to think differently about uh, God being your source. And if he's your source, then you have plenty. And so we need to erase the poverty mentality that we grew up with, which is that of never having enough, that of having lack, that of having zero in the bank account, that of not knowing if the ends are going to get met, that of not knowing if the bills get paid. Always thinking, well, we can't afford that, and we can't afford that. And if I could afford that, well, I can afford that. All the grumbling, complaining that's happened in people's households is a poverty mentality. Because if you really believe that God would always supply every single need you had, and there is no lack for the righteous, then you'd walk around with your head held high saying, glory to God, somehow it's going to turn out. So you got to get rid of the poverty mentality and develop a prosperous inside because prosperity de begins on the inside of us. Number three, every Christian, every real Christian is a giver. Not a dead sea, but a, a, a living ocean that receives and gives and receives and gives and receives and gives. So we have
be a giver to God freely and cheerfully. We have to be a giver to the poor freely and cheerfully. We've got to be a giver to each other freely and cheerfully. If God can get it through you, He can get it to you. And so He's not able to get it to many people because not too many people will let it go through them. Amen. Number four is we're going to have to live a life without worry. Amen. That's right. Worry is not allowed in the Christian's heart concerning anything, but we'll start with money. Jesus said, do not worry. Do not take any thought about tomorrow. Do not worry saying, what are we going to eat? How are we going to pay the bills? Don't you dare do it. Why? Because you have a heavenly father who takes good care of his children. And the only reason you're worried is because you haven't settled the fact that God's your heavenly father. You know it in theory, but you haven't decided for reality that he's a, he's a real father who always takes care of his children. No good parent would ever let their children starve or go to bed hungry. Then the fifth one is you must develop a habit of saving and investing. Little by little, little each month. And that means that when, once you learn the principle, then you override that thought that says, well, I don't have any to save. Because you do. Amen. Every one of you have got enough to save. Every single week you've got something to save. You might have to cut out some frivolous spending. You might have to stop a, a Starbucks or a Red Bull every once in a while. Eliminate one Coca-Cola a week. There you got five, ten bucks a month. You've got to start somewhere. But saving and investing must be a part of every Christian's life. Number six, you're going to have to harvest your fields. And this is where many people have missed it. We've planted good seed in the kingdom. We've given and distributed and planted seed and sowed seed in the kingdom of God. Every time you give money for a right, with a right heart, for a right cause, with the right motive, it goes into the kingdom of God as a seed. And that seed grows and grows and grows, and then harvest comes. But you're going to have to put the sickle in to get your harvest. In Mark chapter 4, the, the farmer sows seed into the ground. The kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day. And he doesn't know how, but first the blade comes up, and then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. And then he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Remember that? So harvest is out there for you. If you've been planting seed, if you've been consisting in, consistent in your giving to God, there's harvest ready, but it's going to require a little effort to get it in. Amen. And we talked last week about it being faith effort. You have to put your faith on the line. You're going to have to go for it with God. You've got to get the plan, and you've got to put some work and some labor and some faith and some belief into going and getting that harvest in. You've got to use your mouth properly and stop trampling your seed. Amen? And so you're going to have to harvest by faith. Today we talk about the seventh principle, the final principle that we've got, which includes a whole bunch of other little principles or other little do's and don'ts and secrets. Uh, but this one is called wisdom. I've never seen a wealthy person without wisdom. I've never seen a person who was wealthy keep their wealth without wisdom. So if you'll turn to 1 Kings with me, chapter 3, we'll begin there. 1 Kings chapter 3. This is our final attitude builder. Somebody once said, attitude is the library of your past, it is the speaker of your present, and it's the prophet of your future. And so Christians uh, have a, we, we have an advantage here. Uh, that we go to the Scripture and we go to God and, and, and develop a right attitude. You need an attitude about money that's, that's better than uh, money is what I buy things with. Money is not what you buy things with. Money is a tool to fulfill purpose in your life. The problem with many is they have very little purpose. And that's why Christians, when they get saved, recognize great purpose almost instantly. <laughs> You get saved and you realize, wow, other people need to be saved. Wow, there's a church. Wow, the church needs to, to be able to continue helping people. So you start seeing purpose almost immediately. You recognize people overseas need the gospel. And, and, and books need to be printed. And wow, money needs to be given because you now have kingdom purpose. Amen. All right, 1 Kings chapter 3. This is after King David has gone home, and Solomon, his son, is the heir apparent for the kingdom of Israel. Remember this? 
And God comes to Solomon in a dream, and he begins to talk. He asks him a couple questions, but God is now going to uh, bless Solomon, the new king, before Solomon ever does anything. And this is almost the ultimate you know, gift of God, the ultimate favor that God puts on us. Before we've gone through a whole bunch of things, God will bless us anyway. That's the grace of God. Without your deserving it, without your earning it, God will bless you. And so God just wanted to bless him. And he says, what do you want? I'll give you anything. Here's where the story picks up. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask, what shall I give you? Solomon said, You've shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You've committed this great kindness, continued this great kindness for him, and you've given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you've made your servant king instead of my father David, but I'm a little child. I don't know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And then God said to him, Because you've asked this thing and have not asked for life, long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but you've asked for yourself an understand, understanding to discern justice. Behold, I've done according to your words. See, I've given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there's not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I've also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so there will not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. Stop there. So notice that God lets him ask anything. Now, if God asked us anything, I, 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 I kind of have a feeling no one would say, give me wisdom. No, what we would do in a natural realm is we would find some problem we need solved. And, God, I need that solved. I need this fixed. I need this person, my child. I need, oh, I need this. And I need, we would go that way rather than look to something very spiritual and intangible. But what I want to talk to you about today is you need to recognize that for true Bible prosperity, you need that unseen, intangible thing called wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to function. It's the ability to solve problems. It's the ability to use knowledge that you have. There's three things that are quite similar and they're very connected. The first is knowledge and you need some. Now, they say knowledge is power, but really knowledge that's used properly is power. Because there's a lot of people that have gotten several degrees and they still could, they can't even land a job because they don't know how to use what they've learned. So you need knowledge, absolutely. You need some facts. You need some truth. But then you need wisdom, because wisdom is the ability to use that knowledge properly for your benefit. Wisdom is the ability to appropriate the knowledge you have, put it to use. And then there's understanding, which is very similar, but the understanding is more the why. Why does that work? How does that work? It's kind of a deeper look at the wisdom. Like wisdom says, if you have a key and you want to start the car, you have to stick it in and turn it. The why would be kind of the mechanism of it, the electricity that flows, the, some of the details under the hood, which is not always necessary to make things happen, but the understanding gives you a deeper and broader understanding of why and why would God think that's important and all those type questions. Make sense? So we need all of that. But wisdom is the principal thing. It's the first thing and we need it. All right. Now, at the end of today, I'm going to talk to you about how to get some. All right. Because you're going to have to put some effort to get extra wisdom. Do you realize not everybody's born into the world with much wisdom? Do you realize that some people are born into the world with wisdom? Some people are and some people aren't. There's different degrees of wisdom that everybody has. But as a believer, you have access to the wise one. And he said in James chapter 1 that if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and doesn't upbraid you or get on you for asking. Amen. Amen. 
But then it goes on to say, let him ask in faith, though. Without doubting and wavering, for he who wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Don't let that man think he'll receive anything from the Lord. And that gives me this quick image of Christians who for many years of their life have heard about wisdom and gone to church and learned a few things, and, but their expression of prayer is, give me wisdom, God. Oh, I just need some wisdom today. I just need some wisdom how to handle this. That doesn't look very confident in their prayer, does it? That looks very fretful. That looks very worried type praying, doesn't it? They're not really expecting any wisdom. They're not really in faith about getting wisdom. They're just nervous. Now, if you're nervous and you need wisdom, go ahead and pray however you want to pray. But I want you to realize that there's a way to go actually get the wisdom you need from God. God I want extra wisdom. I don't have any big problem going on right now. I just want some extra wisdom. I want to grow and develop faster and, and deeper than anybody else this week. I want to grow, God. Give me spiritual wisdom and understanding. And I, I just want to know it, God. I want to see you clearly. I want to learn better. I want to make this stuff work for me. I want to apply what I learned on Sunday into my life. So give me more wisdom right now, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, God for hearing me and answering my prayer. Tomorrow morning, I'm waking up with more wisdom. Thank God. See the difference? Where you actually want it, expect it, make an emphasis on it, and pray it right? So we have to move on from just frantically praying for wisdom in an emergency situation. That's typically how most people end up praying for wisdom. Trying to make a decision, God, I just need wisdom here. What do I do? And that's okay. You can do that. But how about some general wisdom that keeps you on a different level? And so when the problem does come, you don't even have to pray next time. You already know what to do. All right. If you haven't noticed, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made concerning money. Isn't that right? And to make them right, you're going to have to have supernatural wisdom from God to handle things. Hallelujah. So Solomon noticed that he asked for wisdom instead of riches. Some of us here would probably ask if we were given one request of God, give me a million, uh, uh, five million, uh, just a whole bunch, so I don't ever have to worry about money again. Isn't that usually the thought? If I had a whole bunch of money, I wouldn't have to worry about money again. In the kingdom, you have to do it differently. You have to stop worrying about money ever again. And get on God's playing field with this and let him prosper you his way after you've fulfilled the principles. Every one of us can have a full supply. Every one of us can have an abundant financial life if we walk with God and follow the principles. I thought that'd be exciting to you. Hallelujah. Turn to the book of Proverbs, please. Proverbs has some good instruction because it was written by King Solomon who got all that wisdom. If you've never uh, taken a trek through the book of Proverbs, you ought to. Okay, I think every believer, I don't think, I know every believer ought to read the whole Bible at some point. You ought to read the New Testament about five times, then go read the Old Testament after you've read the New Testament a bunch. And then you might want to camp out on Proverbs, or you could sneak Proverbs in, you know, after your first New Testament reading. How about that? But Proverbs is life skill. It's wisdom skill. It's the ability to walk in this earth the way God would have you do it. Right? Because pleasing God is a key factor. Fear God and keep His commands. That kind of sums up everything. If you do it God's way, things will work for you. All right. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3 verse 13 says, Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver, and her gain than fine gold. Notice it calls wisdom and understanding a her, a personal pronoun. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver, and her gain than fine gold. She's more precious than rubies, and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Length of days is in her right hand, in her left hand riches and honor. 
Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and her paths are peace. She's a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. Hallelujah. So, look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, wisdom and understanding, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she'll keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her and she'll promote you. She'll bring you to honor when you embrace her. She'll place a uh, on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she'll deliver to you. Stop there. So wisdom and understanding is the first thing you need to get it. And as a believer entering the kingdom of God, you better be humble enough to say, you know what, he says to get some, I don't even know what that means, but I'm going to get some. I know when I first got in the kingdom of God, I recognized, you know, wow, I, I don't have a clue what spiritual wisdom entails, but I believe I want some. I need to understand this Bible. I need to understand God. I need to know who I am and where I fit and how to succeed in this spiritual life and in the natural life. And so I went after some extra wisdom and ended up, I think I got a little. Anybody who goes after wisdom and means it will get some. Hallelujah. Look at Proverbs chapter 8, verse 18, or verse 12. Proverbs 8, 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion. Skip to verse 18. Riches and honor are with me, enduring riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yes, than fine gold. And my revenue is better than choice silver. Hallelujah. I traverse the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of justice that I may cause those who love me to inherit wealth, that I may fill their treasuries. So wisdom does have a, a, a tight connection to money. See that? Wisdom has a tight connection to money. So if I were to ask you here, would you rather have... Uh, a bucket full of rubies, gold, and silver? Or would you rather have some invisible supernatural wisdom? What would you choose? All you good church-going folks say the right thing, at least in church, don't you? <laughs> but, but let's get real about this. For the past decade... What have you been yearning for more? Come on. Uh -oh. Come on. See, as a spiritual person, you've got to reprioritize what you pursue in your own mind. Good. Yes. Now, I know some of you have been in the kingdom long enough where you thought you asked and got wisdom a long time ago, so now you're ready for the bucket of gold, silver, and rubies. <laughs> but you do have to, when you hear this type of thing, it's like, wait a second, which would I prefer? Hmm. Every one of us owes it to the Lord to evaluate our hearts. Isn't that right? And as I sit here, I think, you know, I, I'm not saying that for Mother's Day, you should give your mother wisdom. Go ahead and give her some rubies and gold and silver. How about that? At the same time, the value we place on certain things has to be reprioritized in our mind. Apparently, it's better to have wisdom than it is to have a bucket full of stuff dumped on you. All right. Praise the Lord. Okay. I want to run through just a few things here that kind of, uh, that it would be wise to do. So with wisdom, you would do these things. All right. And there's more than I have on my list, but it's a way to see how wisdom can help you. And so if you just go after it and then your heart will be enlarged in these matters and you'll Make quicker decisions right, quicker right decisions as you move along in your financial life. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, first thing I want to mention is that it's wise to develop a habit of learning. Wealthy people are learners. Wealthy people know things you don't know. Wealthy people understand how the world economy works. Poor people don't. It's wise to develop a habit of learning. They say that millionaires are readers, okay? Actually, Johnny reminded me that John Wesley said preachers ought to be readers. He said, if you don't read books, you might as well get out of the ministry. 
Millionaires read sometimes one to three books a week. Most poor people don't read one book a year. So there's a reason for everything. And it's not because you got the short end of the stick or your lot didn't come up. It's not because of anything like that. Circumstances can always be changed. Amen. Can always be changed, especially with God on your side, especially with Christ in you. You can do all things through Christ in you. Well, I don't even like reading. Well, with Christ, you can start liking it. I mean, they got audio books these days. You don't even have to know how to read. Okay, I'll get off that. Praise the Lord. It's wise to choose right people to associate with. You need to choose some solid people. You need to choose some wise people. It's okay to occasionally be the wisest person in the circle, but you ought to also have some other wise people in the circle. Right? I mean, you are going to... Here's the deal. In every group, the tendency is always to go the route of the least. Isn't that right? So it matters who you associate with. We, sometimes we think, well, I'll pull everybody up to my level. It usually doesn't happen that way. You might get to add a little benefit to somebody, but usually they'll pull you down to their way. Whether it's their level of speech, their level of intellect, their level of spirituality. Uh, determination is a wise thing. If you're going to do anything that means something, you're going to have to stick to it. Every business that's ever succeeded, somebody behind it just stuck to it. This get rich quick, one, you know, one night, one overnight success stuff is not really the way most things happen. It requires somebody that's diligent, somebody that sticks to it. You'll reap if you don't faint. You need some endurance in your life. You need some patience in your life. Brother James said to count it all joy when you fall into different trials and tribulations, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience or endurance. And let patience have her perfect work that you can be perfect and entire, wanting nothing or lacking nothing. So there's an element of everybody's life. If you're going to succeed, you've got you to stick to it. Well, I tried going to church for three months and everything just went chaotic in my life. Well, you should have gone another three. Well, I tried that tithing business and that giving business, but it sure didn't work for me. You've got to stick to the things of God. You've got to do them because you believe them, not because somebody said try them. Isn't that right? They say that Henry Ford... Uh, had five business failures before he ever succeeded with Ford Motor Company. People get discouraged after one business failure, right? So those are just, or think of Thomas Edison and the light bulb. You've heard the story how, you know, he failed over a thousand times. Some people say 10,000. It's probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, failed over a thousand times before he created one that worked. But to him, they asked him about his failures. He said, I don't see it as a failure. He said, what I realized is uh, a thousand times plus, I learned how light bulbs don't work. <laughs> a thousand times we learned how not to do something, and then finally we'll get it right. So don't be afraid of failure, all right? And some people grow up with that as a child, and I understand, you know, based on the atmosphere when you grew up. But we have to break that and not be afraid of failure. Perfectionists have a fear of failure. You can't have a fear of failure. You've got to get back up and go after it. A righteous man will always get back up and go after it. A righteous man will fall seven times. doesn't say he never falls. It says he falls seven times. Get back up. So the failure is only the one that stays down. So if you're going to succeed at a business or, or get another client or making a sale, just go after it and keep going and keep going and keep going. If you're going to knock on doors, don't be afraid of the 20 that don't answer or say no. You're just looking for the one that will. If you're going to win souls, you've got to be determined. Don't be moved by the you know, 10, 15 people that ignore you and don't want anything to do with you. You're just looking for the one that's ready. Amen. Notice how I threw that in? Oh, you got to throw that in. Don't want to get you chasing money here, right? Because we've already learned that we can't be desiring to be rich and chasing after money. So out of all the blessing we can hear about God's prosperity, it doesn't mean you're supposed to desire to be rich. What are you supposed to desire to be? Spiritual. Desire to be Spiritual. Right? Desire to walk with God and fulfill God's purpose. The riches will be there. 
The problem is we've been chasing after the riches and nothing's there. Now we're just frustrated financially and frustrated spiritually because we didn't seek first the kingdom of God. It's wise not to co-sign for family and friends. Amen. Bible says that. Don't be surety for a stranger or a friend. It'll, it'll, it'll lock you. It'll shackle you to something you don't. It's not your responsibility. Did you know the Bible said that? Yeah. All right. It's wise not to get into debt. Amen. The buy now, pay later scheme is not for us. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean you can't have a house mortgage. It doesn't mean you can't borrow money occasionally. But you do need to monitor and manage what debt you do take upon yourself. You need to make sure you have a right plan of paying it back. It's a wicked person that borrows and doesn't pay back. So don't get yourself over your head. Live on margin. That means you have a room for error, a room for the unexpected. You can't live on the zero line. You've got to always cut back enough to where you have extra just in case. Yeah. Same thing with debts that you take on. All right? I, I'm a big fan of credit cards. I love to use them because they offer me protection with the bank. Okay? They give me points. They give me a one statement. It's got all my charges listed right there. People say, do you want your receipt? I don't want my receipt. I just want one monthly receipt. I know where I've been. <laughs> At the same time, I'm not, I'm not a fan of credit cards if you're not going to pay it off every month. I'm not a fan of credit cards if you're going to use that to dig yourself a hole so that you can have the newest and greatest things. I am a fan of credit cards in that even if you don't have money in the bank, you can uh, uh, still travel to go somewhere or pay for a car repair. I'm, I'm a fan of, of a credit card in an emergency situation, right? Because in an emergency situation, you don't have enough friends to call and make them, you know, drive three hours to give you cash. So there's some wise things to do with credit cards. At the same time, don't use it as a way to dig yourself into a hole. Amen. Amen. And many of you, if you're in credit card debt, you realize that already. I'm trying to, everybody that's not in credit card debt, I'm trying to prepare you for, to not go there. I know that we, we've failed in some of these areas, and we've got issues, and I'm not condemning anybody. What I'm trying to do is make sure that from this day forward, we start doing things properly. Amen. God never puts you down for your mistakes. He never condemns you for what you did wrong. There's a lot of knowledge you didn't have. There's a lot of wisdom you didn't have. We all made dumb decisions. Uh, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about the past. We're talking about the future. Amen. We're not trying to make you feel bad for where you're at and give you no hope. We're trying to help you recognize in order for there to be hope, your bucket needs to be plugged. If you don't fix these principles, well, if God just get me out of the hole, then I'd... No, 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 you've got to fix the principles so God can go ahead and start filling the bucket back up. That's right. That's right. Amen. It's not that God hadn't provided for us. It's that a lot of it leaked out. We squandered it. It's wise to pray in tongues. One of our biggest instructions around here is to pray in tongues. You don't know what to do? What do I usually tell you? Pray in tongues. We're trying to decide if we should do this or that. What do you do? Pray in tongues. Pray it through. Now, when we say pray in tongues, we're talking about you by yourself, at home, or in your car, wherever you are, praying it through diligently. 30 minutes at a time, hour at a time, whatever it takes until, day after day after day if that's what it takes, until you know what to do in your life. A lot of times, a lot of times what to do is in you. The Bible says you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. It's in you. You really do know what to do, but your brain has reasoned some concrete up there. And you can't break through it unless you pray in tongues. So for you to see clearly and for you to have peace in your decision, you're going to have to pray in tongues and edify yourself and clean yourself out and reconnect with the Holy Spirit and get some sensitivity, get some peace, get some smoothness, get the leading of God, get the unction back, and then be confident of what, of what God is showing you. And you do that until you break into the clearing. I liken it to chopping trees. You're going to go through a forest, you chop trees and chop trees and chop trees until you hit the clearing. And that's what praying in tongues is. Now, there's been a big misconception in the church about tongues. Some churches don't even think tongues is for today. 
just ignoring all the scriptures about the benefit of praying in tongues. All right? Um, but let's go ahead and say we, we admit tongues is still for us today. We've heard them, right? And we've done, we've done them. Uh, but even among the Spirit-filled churches, there's a misconception that tongues are only for the church. Only, tongues are only for a tongue and an interpretation in the church that turns into a prophetic message for the hour for the people that are there. But tongues is more than that. Sure, there is a gift of God. When it talks about the gift of tongues, it's talking about for the edification of everybody that's there. Either tongues are given for people to hear in their known language, or tongues are given with an interpretation so we can understand and be edified. Those are two uses of tongues. But the third use of tongues is for you in prayer by yourself between you and God to connect with the Holy Spirit, allow Him to give you utterance and speak mysteries unto God. To edify yourself, to build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. And so that's where you can tap into the wisdom of God. So it's wise to pray in tongues. Make sense? Like I said before, I'd pay you to pray in tongues if I could, because I know the benefit of it. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. It's wise to be spirit-led in your decision-making. What does that mean? Well, have you ever heard a message on how to be led by the Spirit of God? We have them in the bookstore. We have them online. How to be led by the Spirit of God. Is that important, do you think? Yeah, as a believer, we have the Holy Spirit in us. The Bible says that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And so our life should be led by the Holy Spirit, not by your reasoning skills, which I'm sure are very good. But your life should be led by God. Sometimes we reason ourselves out with our, you know, human logic, which is needed many times, but as a spiritual person, we must devote our life to be led by the Spirit of God. And if you don't know how, how that feels and what that means, you need to investigate. You need to learn. Isn't that right? Uh, Joni and I have, have made it a practice in life. That's how we live. We make decisions based on the leading of the Spirit. All right? I remember before we were even married, I was, I was uh, searching for an engagement ring, and I was led by the Spirit. Okay? I started my quest for an engagement ring by asking Joni if I could go ahead and pick it out on my own. <laughs> you know, here I am. I finally found a good thing, and I'm, I'm wanting to be the hero, and I can do this. I can find a ring. I can do this. I don't, you know, just let me do it. I'll follow the Spirit, and I can do this. And so I asked her, I said, can I go, let me, let me pick it out for you. She said, let me pray about that. <laughs> the next day, she tells me, you, I feel okay with letting you go ahead and pick it out. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm, so, I'm the hero. I can do this. So anyway, I go out searching for rings and went to Diamond Wholesalers, and I'm searching around and finally found a wholesaler that I liked, and I'm looking at diamonds and trying to pick them out and learning all the things about the color and the clarity and all that. That's like a lost skill because you only get, you, you get married once, you learn all these details, and you never can use that knowledge again. <laughs> but I did it, man. I went through it all, and I was fired up, and <clears throat> I'm selecting stones and looking through the loop and all that, and uh, finally found one out of what he had that was probably the best one for me, and it looked pretty good, and so I went ahead and bought it, and took it home, and I'm looking at it and showed my parents, and I uh, kept looking at it, and something just didn't feel right. Something just didn't feel right. Seemed to be the only one available. Something just didn't feel right, and I thought, you know what? This, is, this just doesn't feel right. I'm going back to the guy. So I went back to the jeweler. And I uh, walked in. I said, you know, something just doesn't feel right about this. I said, do you have any more for me to look at? He said, oh, we just got a shipment in this morning. And so he pulls out. He goes, let's see what we got. And he pulled out four or five more. Bingo. There was the one. I saw it. My heart leapt. I had a joy, a peace, an excitement. And then he told me the extra price on it. It was like <laughs> three, or $4,000 more. I think it was $3,000 more. I said, that's all right. That's the one right there. Johnny's over there dancing about it. 
And so I had to trust God for the extra money, but it actually came the next day, I think. And so I bought that stone, and praise the Lord, she loved her ring. And uh, matter of fact, when I handed her the ring, when I handed her the ring uh, in my state of euphoria, she said yes and hugged me and, and was a little reluctant to even open the box. <laughs> but that's okay, that's okay. God takes good care of her. So in order for that to happen, I have to be led by the Spirit. That makes sense? We did the same thing when we were searching for a house. We wanted to build a house in this neighborhood that had a few lots left. And so we drove in there and, and talking to the builders, uh, trying to pick a lot and trying to pick a house plan that fit on the lot. And I wanted a big backyard, and we wanted specifics in the house. And so we're trying to do it and finally came upon something that might work. Wasn't really the best for us, uh, which wouldn't fit on the land we wanted, but we found one that would fit and was pretty good, and so we, we signed, and we paid the earnest money, $5,000, and, and uh, we're kind of excited about it and went home. Well, that night, the whole time, I'm just, just unsettled about it, just unsettled about it, and it just, something just didn't seem right. It wasn't the perfect fits for some reason, and so we get home, and then the next day, we get up, and I feel the same way. And um, I told John, we were at the old church building, and I said, I, I, I left the, the building that day during office hours. I said, I'm, I'm going to go back over that property. Maybe there's something we missed. So I drove over to that neighborhood and was driving around and found a whole section of neighborhood we had not been in with a whole separate builder. Now, it was a little bit higher in cost, and maybe that was the reason we never went there in the first place, but I thought maybe they got something. So I drove around and went to the, the, the main office and, or the model home and walked in, and wow, this just feels right. And so we found a lot of land, and we found a house plan that just seemed perfect. Now, it was more money, and you have to realize that, you know, we all want to get a good deal on things, but you can't go through life being a cheapo. you got to go through life... Uh, causing right things to happen, doing things by the will of God, doing things by purpose, not just to get the best deal. You need a good product as well, right? <clears throat> and so we found the thing, we signed the money, and the other people let us have our earnest money back, praise the Lord. And so it just felt right. And so that's how we need to go through life in our purchasing or our business starting. We need to go by the, the peace of God. And so don't ever let yourself get too pressured by the natural, all right? It's wise not to be pressured by the natural, not by people, not by dates and times, not by yourself, and certainly not by the devil. Amen. Our motto is, if you feel pressure, it's not from God because he doesn't pressure you into things. He doesn't toss you into things. He doesn't shove you around and make you do things. He leads you. He tugs you. He pulls you. He doesn't push you. Amen? And so people will just sometimes have to recognize that you haven't made your decision yet, and that's okay. Right? Amen. Matter of fact, there's times when if someone's pushing me, they just blew the whole deal. They pushing me, it's over, man. You're not going to push me around. Me and God decide what happens here. Isn't that right? <clears throat> it's wise to file your taxes every year. I know some of you are groaning on the inside. Okay, you cannot get behind with the IRS, especially if you own your own business. Uh, every month you need to set aside tax money because you're going to have to pay. Pay now or pay a lot later. But you can't get in trouble with, with your IRS and your taxes, so you must do that diligently on the due date. Or file your extension and finish that on the due date. You with me? Matter of fact, while I'm at it, you need to pay your tickets. You need to pay your fines. You cannot get behind and get warrants out for your arrest. That is not wise ever. Ever. Legal stuff, you better be on your toes all the time. You with me? This is life. This is wisdom for your life. It's not acceptable for you to be loose in all these decisions. You with me? Quiet in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's wise to prepare your kids for these things. Train up your kids in the ways of money. 
Learn them yourself. Plug your bucket. Give your child a good bucket. You're not just living for yourself. You're living for your children as well. It's wise to fear the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn with me to Proverbs 15. A few more scriptures will be done. Proverbs 15. Verse 22 says, Without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors they're established. Another scripture says, Purposes go awry, but in the multitude of counselors they're established. So it's wise to get counsel. It's wise to hang out with right people, and if you're making big decisions, go get some go do some research and ask some people that know what they're doing. Look at Proverbs 16, verse 16 says, How much better to get wisdom than gold, and to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. Look at Proverbs 21, verse 20 says, there is desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man squanders it. Notice this, uh, this refers to a couple things. That one, you ought to have, well, if you have wisdom, you'll have treasure. You'll have savings, right? If you have wisdom, you'll have savings. But a foolish man will squander it. So if you've squandered everything all these years and don't have any savings, it's time today to start on this new wisdom track, okay? Glad you're all enthused about it. Again, don't, don't get caught in the same rut that the half the world did. Well, I don't have enough to save. If I had any, one day when I finally have some, I'll save it. No, that is not acceptable. I know I'm talking to you like a parent would to a child because we, we have to get this in us. Yes. Amen? I've talked to so many people about setting up a mutual fund for themselves. So many through these years. I mean, I'll talk to anybody about it. Matter of fact, that's one of the topics of conversation at the dinner table. No matter who I'm at dinner with, hey, you got a savings plan, you got an investment plan, you got a mutual fund, you got a 401k, you got an IRA. And if they say no, I'm on them. And out of all my talking and preaching, very few ever do anything about it. Sounds good at the time, not enough diligence to go after it. What do I do? I, I don't know. I'll just keep telling you. I'm going to keep preaching until you do it. I'll keep telling you to pray in tongues until you start praying in tongues. That's what preachers do. I didn't realize it back when I was in the world that I was a preacher. I wasn't preaching the word, but I was preaching to people. One time somebody even told me that. I was at a, at, a, at a job, and I was the manager, and the people under me gave me an upwards evaluation. How's your manager doing? And it was all good, except one guy said, uh, you know, he gave me all these good marks and everything. He said, but, but he's always preaching to us. And I was preaching about them. I was, I was, one of my big things was ongoing education at the company. So I was always telling them to get in some extra classes, and they just got tired of it. And so he said, he's always preaching to us about further education here. And when, it, when I read that preaching thing, something, it's like, wow, is that what I do? So have mercy on me. It's just what God put in me, all right? Or just do it. Finally do it, and I'll quit preaching it, okay? <laughs> some of you wonder, when are we going to stop talking about money? When we get it right. Hallelujah. Um, turn with me to Ephesians 1. We'll end here. It's wise, not to, it's wise to recognize the love of money and how it can sneak up on you and bite you. All right? Um, love of money is the root of all evil, and it can be seen in so many ways. Think of it this way. Uh, if there's money on the table, if there's arbitrary money that, uh, is kind of free money, like here's some extra who gets it. Uh, think of the pouncing that goes on. Think of inheritance money with the, within a family. Think of how many times families have been destroyed and separated because of the inheritance divvy, divvying, dividing, right? Uh, and for some reason, it just creates so much strain because there's money there. 
Free money. Oh, I need my share. This will help my life. And um, I remember this uh, cartoon, Finding Nemo. Remember that show? And I remember a time when a, one of the little fish or shrimp or something jumped up on the deck uh, near the water, came up on the deck. And, and there was a bunch of seagulls standing around, and, and the, one of the seagulls said, mine. <laughs> and then the other one next to him said, mine. Mine. Mine, 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 mine. And then they went and chased after the thing. And I remember th watching that thinking, that's, that's how some people are. If there's a something come up, you know, they're, they're going to go chase it, right? They're going to fight for it. And, and I'm, all for, I'm all for making the right thing happen, happen in the inheritance splitting, all right? I think it ought to be shared rightly. But for some reason, people think they get more than the others. There's got to be justice. So I'm all for, for fighting for justice. Does that make sense? At the same time, don't go after more than is right. All right, your money decisions are going to have to be made rightly. You're going to have to be just in everything you do. Amen. In your business dealings, you better have a just scale. Yes. You can't dial it down when you're selling and dial it up when you're buying or vice versa. You got to be just about it. The Bible says that it's unrighteous in a business deal to tell the seller, oh, it's nothing, it's nothing, and, and point out all these issues, and then buy it for a cheap price and go home and say, hey, look what I got. Oh, I got a great deal. Oh, yeah, jimmied him down and all that. That's wrong. That's unrighteous. In a business transaction, both sides should be blessed. Amen. The buyer and the seller should both benefit at a transaction. Make sense? Everybody should be happy when it's done rightly. So you fight for that. You fight for that. We're righteous. We're the people of God. We've got to do money right. And this manipulating in the business world is not acceptable. Hallelujah. The love of money will creep up on you and cause you to start looking at other people's pockets. Well, he's rich. Why come he don't just give it to me? Look at this store. They're so rich. How come they can't give me a deal? You better stop that. Amen. Right? Yes, Amen. Poverty counts other people's money. Don't you dare start counting other people's money. You know, there's, there's probably people that look over at our, our bookstore with our gospel products and think they shouldn't sell those. They ought to give those away. What they're doing is they're not valuing the product. Right. You ever walked into a television store and thought, they ought to just give these away. I don't know why they're selling them. It's because you value that. You realize something with value costs something. Gospel products are valuable and they cost something. Now, we've given tons of them away. Tons of We've given more away than we've sold probably through the years. So you, and then some ministries give them away as part of their giveaway, part of their blessing, right? I understand that. Well, we give away stuff on the media, online. We're paying big bucks to get this gospel around the world with no return necessarily. What about te television ministries? Do you know most of them are in the, in, the, in the red about that? Most television ministries aren't making money. They're going in the hole for the sake of the gospel getting spread. You realize that? Yeah. So that's a gift. People should value gifts. People should value the product. And if you valued God, you'd give to God. If you valued gospel products, you'd, you'd buy them. Yeah. If you valued your spiritual growth, you'd pay for it. All right, so just in case you need a little extra wisdom. And I assure you, if you'll do this, I'm going to show you some prayers. And if you'll pray these prayers, and if you'll get serious about getting some wisdom, and just spend about a month being real serious about it. All right? Spend about a month being real serious about this, and you'll end up in one month, and you'll be wiser than you were. You'll understand the gospel better. You'll understand God's kingdom. You'll be happier on the inside. God will be able to trust you more to solve problems, trust you more with more money, trust you in all of his purposes when you get more wisdom. So here's some prayers that other men of God before us have found and prayed. When I learned it, I said, well, I can do that. So I prayed them, and I, I saw a change in me. Matter of fact, one time I decided to pray it for somebody that didn't know I was praying about it. And I prayed for extra wisdom for my first pastor. And I spent about two weeks praying for him to have more spiritual wisdom and understanding. And, and after about two or three weeks, he stood up in the pulpit and he said, the Lord spoke to me this morning and told me he's going to give me more wisdom. And I thought, ha, it's probably because I was praying. I don't know for sure. 
But it absolutely works, and you'll see a change in your heart. Amen. All right? Ephesians chapter 1 is where the prayer is, and then you need to turn this prayer into a personal prayer for you. This was Paul's prayer to the church at Ephesus, and he said this, verse 15, he said, Therefore I also, after I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Here's the prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Stop there. That's the prayer he prayed for them. What we should do is pray it for ourselves in this manner. God, I pray that you would give me the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that the eyes of my understanding would be, in, would be enlightened, that I may know what is the hope of my calling, of your calling me, that I may know what is the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, and I want to know what is the greatness of your power to us who believe according to the working of your mighty power, which you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above... And you can just go on and on and on. The only reason I know this prayer is because I prayed it so many times. I didn't memorize it. It just got in my heart so much because I was seeking. And as you pray it, you start thinking, what am I praying about? The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you? What does that mean? Well, you start contemplating and meditating and praying it with emphasis, and that's when it starts happening to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So pray that. And then Philippians chapter 1 has, the, has a similar prayer, and Colossians chapter 1 has a similar prayer. And they're all around the same thing. It's this spiritual, uh, almost undetectable uh, substance that we need for our spiritual life and our spiritual growth. Amen? And so I, I just encourage you, challenge you, whatever, to go after it for about a month and pray it every day, a couple times a day, so much so that it gets in your heart and you start expecting it to happen to you. Hallelujah. And so we're going to be wisdom walkers. We're going to be kingdom people with wisdom. We're going to start handling money right. There's no reason for us not to. Amen. And I dare to say that you should be uh, uh, higher in the bucket next year than you are this year. How about that? Our wealth should grow little by little, slowly but surely. In the plan of God, big things happen. Somebody just testified that after last week, last week I think we prayed for some people. We made some confessions as we've been doing, and, and we've had several testimonies already. Uh, he already got three job offers, all 20% more than he's making. Yeah. Hallelujah. So that'd be nice to have a pick of the litter, right? Yeah. So let's expect big things. Go ahead and stand up to your feet. We need to expect that the prosperity covenant comes to pass for you and me. Glory. Let me have the band come on up here. Hallelujah. I'm going to lead you in a short confession. I'm going to lead you in a short confession, and then we'll have some music, give you a time for some prayer up here. But let's go ahead and, and reach out with the hand of faith, and let's say some things. Let's speak to the money. Remember, money's, uh, money comes from, well, paper money comes from trees. Trees come from the dirt. And the dirt we have authority over. Behold, I give you authority over all the earth. And so we have authority over this earth. And so if we need some money, we've got to call that money in. If we want money to start working for us, we need to tell it to. Everything has an ear to hear. If the fig tree could hear Jesus speak, then the paper money from the fig tree or the oak tree or the pine tree can hear us speak to it. And so let's say some things. You've got to get your mouth going in this. You've got to speak to things. You've got to make mountains move. You've got to call finances in if you need them. All right? And you've got to stop danger from your crop, too. So let's do that real fast. Just close your eyes and say these words out loud. Say, Father, thank you so much for this covenant. I am prosperous in it because you're my Father. And so right now I call upon it, this covenant, that you'll see to it, that I have an abundant supply for every good work and every need. 
And so I thank you for that now. And I'm going to use my authority and call it in. So at harvest, you come to me. You come now in every form. I call the money in. You're mine. I've worked for you. I've followed principles. And I command the harvest in. I get the harvest. I put the sickle in now. I'm not going to fail. I'm going to increase. Because God's my Father. And because I've followed in His steps. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. Chaz and Joni Stevenson have a New Testament vision of spreading the full gospel of Christ around the world, helping unbelievers meet Jesus Christ, and building strong Christians who can impact their world, and are doing so by preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. To join us in that vision, please consider an offering to help with media costs, or an offering to simply show the value of the spiritual things you have received. You may give online, by mail, or by phoning in with a credit card. If you're in Houston, Texas, and looking for a good home church, Pastors Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we're certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. To watch services via live streaming, or for more information about God, Houston Faith Church, or Stevenson Ministries, please visit us on the web, or download our Houston Faith phone app, or catch our Houston Faith TV Roku channel. 